Sidney Wallach was for a brief period of time a sports writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and covered the St. Louis Browns. He was in the World War II and graduated from Washington University in St. Louis. He was with the St. Louis Post-Dispatch as a sports writer and before that a reporter and a rewrite man with the New York Herald Tribune in Paris. Went back to St. Louis, got into Washington University, and I went downtown one day and ran into J. Roy Stockton, who was the sports editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and I showed him my articles, and uh, Roy said, uh, how'd you like to come to work for us for the summer? I was in college then. And you know, this is like a dream. You know, he, he, 21 year old kids didn't go to work for the St. Louis Post Dispatch Sports Department uh, for summer. I mean, this is what every kid wanted. But by God, he took me in, and that was in 47. But it was Ring Lardner who wrote a story called You Could Look It Up. And it was about a ball club that threw a midget up at the plate, warned him, don't you swing at the ball, and he did. <laughs> he hit the ball. And everybody was laughing so hard <laughs> that they couldn't, they couldn't pick up the ball. <laughs> but it took them about an hour and a half to get the first base, you see. And they find it. the story ends with them, with the owner picking up the midget by the by the legs and twirling him around and throwing him out the center field. And the center fielder catches him, and the umpire says, "You're out." <laughs> but that's where the midget thing started. Was with Ring Lardner. The Browns own Sportsman's Park. <laughs> But they leased it out to the Cardinals, and the two teams play on it. No time, you know, to, to do this stuff. Well, death is giving around August, couldn't stand it anymore, and he'd head off to he'd head off to Mexico and hole up in a room someplace and forget that he ever covered the Browns. <laughs> and uh, uh, when that happened, while the rest of the guys on the paper would get a chance to cover him, and I still recall it, the the press box, and you climbed up 128 steps, 128 steps, and you walked across the catwalk, and got into that press box, and you talk about midgets, boy, when you look down on that field, those people were about three inches high, I mean, you couldn't tell what was going on. I mean, he covered three, four ball games in my whole life with the Browns. I was a really junior, I mean, really junior right now. When you were writing baseball, you had a typewriter in front of you, and you had a telegrapher next to you. I mean, a real telegrapher. You know, da, 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 da. And as you'd write, he'd, he'd send it. There was a guy on the other end of the newspaper with a headset on, and he, he I got, put it in, on the paper, and it would go in the paper. If you were wrong, if you made a mistake, forget it. He said it. He was right. He was right. You'd sit there, and you'd write a fresh story. And then you go down to the paper and you do what we called an overnight story, which was a real, you know, a real think piece, you know, on why they lost it. But anyhow, uh, the Browns, you know, it was Major League Baseball. It was Major League Baseball. And I don't know if you guys know the story of the Browns about that time. But Don Barnes sold it to the DeWitts, and the DeWitts sold it to Bill Vett. And Bill Beck right away wanted to move that ball club up to Milwaukee. But he couldn't because Milwaukee was the triple A franchise of the Braves. So then he wanted to move it to Baltimore, but the, the owners hated Bill Beck so much that they weren't going to allow him to do anything, anything at all. So uh, Bill Beck had to sell the club. Uh, to, I forget who he sold it to. He sold it to somebody, and then they permitted them to move the club to Baltimore. They wouldn't let Bill Beck make a nickel on it. When Bill Beck came in, the Browns were drawing about 250,000 people a year. Bill Beck doubled that. They were drawing around 600,000 people a year when Bill Beck owned that club. And I gotta tell you a couple of stories. Bob Munker, right hand pitcher, was on the mound. And I can't tell you what inning it was, but he got short hopped right in the you know what. <laughs> and he went down like somebody had shot him. I mean, he didn't stagger or anything. He went down. <laughs> and they got him off the field. 
and put in you know, a relief pitcher. And after the game, I went down to the clubhouse, and there's Moncrief standing in front of his locker, and he looks fine to me. And I said, ah, Bob, that must have hurt. He said, ah, oh, he said, it didn't hit me there. He said, it hit me in the gut, and I swallowed my jaw. <laughs> <laughs> but Bob Ray was one of the great baseball writers of all time, and he became sports editor of the Post-Dispatch. He's now 81 years old, and he lives in St. Louis, and he is a great, 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 great baseball writer. A great writer, as a matter of fact. He's written a couple of plays, and uh, I don't think they've been produced, but he's, he's a fine writer. And I talked to Bob. I knew I was coming down here, and I thought maybe I'd pick up a couple of stories. And Bob said one of the stories people don't know about was that at the end, I know I don't know if it was 47 or 48, 49, I don't know what season it was. But Dizzy Dean was under a commercial contract with the Chicago Cubs. You know, he played for the for the Cubs at the end. And he was broadcasting for the Browns with I think Gabby Street. And they changed stations. I don't know, somebody bought something. And they changed stations, they didn't want Dean anymore. So Dean was a little upset, and he went to the Browns management and said, I'll tell you what, he said, let me pitch to the last game of the season. Well, of course, they were in eighth place, you know, the Browns, you know, remember the saying, first in booze, first in shoes, and last in the American League, that was St. Louis. <laughs> Diz got a release from the Chicago Cubs for that one game, and he was the last game of the season, and he went out, and pitched, and he was throwing side on him, all right? He and he got, he got four innings of scoreless ball. Four innings, they didn't score on him. At the bottom of the fourth inning, he gets a hit, no kid that, got a hit, slid into second base and jammed his foot. And his wife is in the stands and said, I hope to God they get him out of there before he kills himself. <laughs> and they did, they took him out, and he didn't have five innings and never got credit for the game. No so kidding. you can look it up all you want, but Dizzy Dean pitched the last game of one of those, of those seasons. Uh, by the way, another interesting story. In the late years, uh, the Browns' uh, spring camp was in Burbank, California. And they stayed at the Hollywood Roosevelt, no, no, the Hollywood Plaza Hotel on the corner of Hollywood and Vine. And you know, five years after that, I had an office in the Taft Building, which was on the corner on Hollywood and Vine. So you know, what <laughs> comes around, well, you know, always. They had a sports writer emeritus, John E. Ray, W-R-A-Y. John Ray had been sports editor of the Post-Dispatch since I don't know, 1830 or something. He had been there forever, and his eyesight had gone. Well, in those days, we didn't have air conditioning in the sports room. And we don't have it in this room either. Yeah. <laughs> and every desk had a spittoon. And every night, the women had come through, and they empty these spittoons in a big bucket, and they'd wash them out, and they'd put antiseptic water in there, it smelled like crazy. But the guys, and everybody smoked in those days, you'd take your cigarettes, you didn't have an ashtray, you threw it in the spittoon. Well, every morning, John Ray, this old man, who was blind as a bat, but could still write his column, every morning he'd get up from his desk, and he'd stagger around his desk, and he'd kick over one of those goddamn oh, spittoons, you see. And of course, my job was to grab a bunch of copy paper, and I'd have to throw it on the floor, and <laughs> sum that up, and I'd move that spittoon all over the place, and once a week, old Johnny e. Ray would find that spittoon and kick it over, and I'd have to suck it up.